Good evening. This is foreclosure defense attorney and legal blogger Roy Oppenheim. Tonight we're doing something completely different and we indulge you to uh, give us some feedback on what we're going to do this evening, but this is the inaugural program of From the Trenches. And um, for the past several years we now have provided a uh, workshop for the general public on the real estate crisis. And starting tonight, we thought we would broaden our scope by having key players that are part of the story, have, have been so involved with the story, uh, to be part of the program. And, and so it's, it's absolutely my pleasure to have uh, Steve Stock, who is the investigative reporter for, for CBS, uh, who has broken, uh, as we'll see, uh, the story on, on, on numerous issues concerning real estate, and an old, old dear friend, uh, and, and to some extent a mentor, uh, Pat Sessions, who uh, is not only a, a councilman uh, in, uh, in Coconut Grove, but more importantly, uh, was the, the genius behind the, the Western development. He was the first president of, of the Western division of, of Arvida, and uh, is now involved with, with a major real estate project. And before we proceed, I want each of you just to do a little self-introduction, because I'm sure I missed some stuff. I'll start with you, Steve, if I may. If I may and just uh, elaborate a little bit on, on your background. Well, Roy, thanks for having me here. Uh, it's certainly a pleasure to share what little bit I know. As an investigative reporter for CBS here in Miami, we have delved into the issue of mortgage foreclosures, who's at fault, who uh, perhaps is getting the blame unfairly, and what is really going on behind that, particularly with the idea that the consumer is the person who has been blamed for a lot of this and yet the consumer seems to be getting the short end of things. So with your help, Roy, we've done some investigating and we've actually, as uh, the CBS4i team here in Miami, uh, have been looking at this issue for well over a year. And we are certainly proud of the work we've done. As you should be. Pat? Um, as you said, I, I've kind of got my spurs uh, running West End when it first started out years ago. Uh, we took it from about 200 homes a year to 1,200 before I left there, and, and that was our Vita, and they finished it up. It's a city now, as you know. It's uh, incorporated. It's interesting to look at the, the differences of what happened in that project. Uh, we had a, a big spike in interest rates during that project. It was really tough on us. I don't remember one foreclosure. Um, I've got uh, a 2,000 acre project right now in Jacksonville, Durban Crossing, and that project um, is now in the throes of what every other project is in this country. Uh, we not only have homeowners with foreclosures, we've got our builders with foreclosures. So it's, a, it's an interesting dynamic that in, in a different scenario, but a very difficult time, we didn't have any of these issues. Now we have a totally new set of issues to deal with. The, the problem that you address is, is, is just so unique uh, to the nation, but particularly in Florida, it's interesting because Florida always had this boom to bust cycle. But the Federal Reserve always said that, that real estate was local and that, and that these little boom to bust cycles would always be localized. And so this is the first time that we've seen in our country's history, except maybe during the Depression, where there's a bust that has occurred through the entire nation. And so uh, Florida probably has more of an experience of dealing with this than any other part of the country. What we want to do tonight is, is to look a little bit at, at how the press, as Steve has talked about, initially treated this problem and this crisis. And we're going to use 60 minutes because they, they've been good enough to uh, continue to cover the story. But I want, to all I, I want everyone to look at how the story has, has evolved and also how Steve has been involved with that process. And then we're going to talk further about uh, how we got into this mess, how we're going to get out of this mess. And, and I'm going to let Pat lead a little bit on, on what he thinks is, is going to happen in terms of uh, how homeowners are going to benefit uh, from this in some way and how uh, we can all get out of this collectively. So I'd like to go to the, the first 60-minute piece that ran approximately a year ago. Uh, Cal, can you run that, please? Thank you. In tracking uh, house prices across the country, what has the loss been in terms of value? Well, nationally, we are down about 30% from the peak. But uh, in some cities, it's worse. Mainly in the Southwest. Well, cities that went up a lot tended to be the ones that go down a lot. Phoenix and Las Vegas, I gather. Are Vegas is the worst. It's down 56% since its peak. Uh, uh, Phoenix is down 51%. An awful lot of people are walking away from their mortgages, even though right. they can fully afford to pay them. Is that yes. phenomenon going to become viral? 
<laughs> it's interesting you use the word viral. A viral, a virus spreads by contagion. And I think that exactly this phenomenon might spread by contagion. In fact, there was a recent study that showed that people are more likely to declare themselves ready to default if they knew somebody else who had done so. It's contagious. People are inhibited from defaulting on their mortgage by a moral sense that we're Americans, we live up to our contracts. But when you see two or three other people down the road defaulting, and then when you do the calculations about how much money you're losing by not defaulting, a lot of people will say, hey, you know, I'm a moral person, but there's a limit to how much I'm going to uh, support markets at this time. Times and things are different. I mean, as a child of the Depression, let me tell you that the most shameful thing you could, that could happen to you was to lose your house. My argument is, that, in fact, that people feel too shameful um, about uh, letting go of their home. And, in fact, people might be better off making economic decisions, rational decisions in their best interest. White says big businesses make such bottom-line decisions all the time. Morgan Stanley walked away from five San Francisco office buildings they bought at the height of the boom. And real estate developer Tishman Spire defaulted on the huge $5.4 billion Stuyvesant Town apartment complex in New York City earlier this year when its value fell by nearly half, making it one of the biggest walkaways in real estate history. It's a trend the banks fear could catch on with average homeowners. Already, the CEO of Citibank's mortgage unit estimates that one in five borrowers who default on their mortgages are able to pay. If that number rises, it could jeopardize any economic recovery. No bank we contacted would talk publicly about strategic defaults, but all indicated they'd be unwilling in most cases to help underwater homeowners who can't afford to keep up their payments. And Commissioner Stevens agrees with the banks. To simply allow anybody who just decides they don't want their home anymore, who signed a contract to purchase a home, to walk away and get some sort of write-off <clears throat> with a program backed by the administration or a financial institution um, creates a whole new set of standards that will live with us for years to come. The question is, who pays that bill? Times and things are different. I mean, as a child of the Depression, let me tell you that the most shameful... Steve. A year ago, 60 Minutes was focusing almost exclusively on the conduct of homeowners. They were looking at strategic default. They were looking at the moral issues of how homeowners uh, should or shouldn't default versus companies. The government is saying that, that it's going to create new standards. Not one word, not one word about the bank's conduct. And we know now that between congressional reports, the Federal Reserve, the Security and Exchange Commission, even the Internal Revenue Service, that they all are now focusing on, on just horrific, immoral conduct by Wall Street. What, what do you think gives? Well, I think it's a complicated question. I, I think you have to understand, especially in the media, you have to create, as a reporter, a narrative. And a narrative um, sometimes has trouble with nuance. And this is a very complicated and multi-layered issue. Um, I point to the book by Michael Lewis, The Big Short, where Michael spent a lot of time and energy looking into the bundling of mortgages. And you mentioned mortgages and the default of mortgages and this mortgage crisis as being a local problem heretofore up until this latest great recession. And I think part of that is because back in the day when you went to the bank, you got a bank, I remember my parents at Black Mountain Savings and Loan in Black Mountain, North Carolina, they got a mortgage from Black Mountain Savings and Loan which held that mortgage for 25, 30 years. When my wife and I bought a mortgage in Ocala, Florida, within 18 months that mortgage was split up four or five ways, bundled off and sold as a security on Wall Street. That did away with a local mortgages. And so I think I think Morley Safier's point was that 
people needed to start treating mortgages as a business and as the big corporations treated real estate in New York. And so I'm not sure 60 Minutes was focusing exclusively on the individual mortgage holder as trying to find a narrative for to help explain what was a very unique and growing problem. You're right, they didn't mention that. Did they know about it? I don't know. I do know that there were reporters, including myself, at that time digging around. But as you know, Roy, it took a while, and we had to uncover what ended up being a very, very big and different story. Fascinating. And, and Pat, when you were doing Arvita, and, you were, and we had special uh, lend, lender relationships, like SunTrust, for example, right. they didn't dice and slice up their loans, did No, they? it was, it was the, the traditional mortgage, like, like Steve was talking about. It's, you know, it was right. You, you got a loan, you paid it off to the same bank that you got it from for 25 years, and that was it. I think where the banks got a little sideways, uh, and something everybody sort of ignores here is, is that it's a risk reward for the banks, and they risk adjusted mortgages and charged fees and charged interest rates. And what they would never say is they really are your partner. Right. And you know, uh, considering that they caused one of the biggest meltdowns in this, this country's history, to now say we're not part of this, you're walking away from this, and you're stiffing us is you know, pretty, pretty hard to imagine. Disingenuous, perhaps. That's the word I was looking for. And, 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 <laughs> and I think Pat raises a very good issue, and that is there was no more partnership. And fi in fact, if you read Michael Short uh, Lewis's book, The Big Short, I, he's very, very wise to point out that banks actually made money even as the mortgages defaulted. There were actually people gambling on the fact that you would fail. That's you right. as a homeowner would fail. Well, there's no incentive for Wall Street to make sure you pay your mortgage then because they win both ways. And that is when this, what Pat talks about, this, this roller coaster, this avalanche started to inc impact the entire economy. You know, so I was having lunch with Lisa Bayer the other day and we were talking about you know, what did the banks do that's just morally so reprehensible? And I said, you know, it's one thing if you go to Vegas and you count cards. You know, that's okay because that means you're smart, you're outsmarting the system, right? But if you're using a marked deck of cards, right, and you're slipping bad mortgages into portfolios and then you're shoving them over to, over to AIG and buying insurance to hope they fail, that is the equivalent of playing with marked cards. And I don't care what you call it, I call that cheating. And when you, you get caught, the fact is that you have now paid the price of taking everyone down with you. It, it, for me, it's just been uh, a morally reprehensible story, a story that I guess I have understood for maybe three years now. And, and I'm just pleased that only now, and finally, everyone gets it. I, I'm pleased that the, the real estate development community gets it, and I'm thrilled that, that the media, and more importantly, that the judges finally are starting to get it. I want to move to two more video clips. I want to move to, to another 60 Minutes piece, I think that's next, Cal, uh, where all of a sudden they're starting to focus on bank conduct. One thing weighing on the economy is the huge number of foreclosed houses. Many are stuck on the market for a reason that you wouldn't expect. Banks can't find the ownership documents. It's bizarre, but it turns out that Wall Street cut corners when it created those mortgage-backed investments that triggered the financial collapse. Now that banks want to evict people, they're unwinding these exotic investments to find that often the legal documents behind the mortgages aren't there. Caught in a jam of their own making, some companies appear to be resorting to forgery and phony paperwork to throw people down on their luck out of their homes. In the 1930s, we had bread lines. Venture out before. Did dawn. you ask for copies of those documents? Yes. And what did you find? When I looked at the assignment of mortgage, and this is the assignment, a copy from my case, I looked at even the date they put in, which was 10 17 2008, was several months after they sued me for foreclosure. So what they were saying to the court was we sued her in July of 2008. And we acquired this mortgage in October of 2008. It made absolutely no sense. Curious, she used her legal training to go online and researched 10,000 mortgages. Then I began to find the, the strange signatures. One of the strangest signatures belonged to the bank vice president who'd signed Simoniac's newly discovered mortgage documents. The name is Linda Green. 
but on thousands of other mortgages, the style of green signature changed a lot. And even more remarkable, Simoniak found that Linda Green was vice president of 20 banks, all at the same time. All within the same week. I mean, this is a very, very active person. And you can Where did all those documents come from? We went searching for the Linda Green, and we found her in rural Georgia. She told us she's never been a bank vice president. In 2003, she was a shipping clerk for auto parts when her grandson told her about a job at a company called Docs, D-O-C-X. Docs, once housed here in Alpharetta, Georgia, was a sweatshop for forged mortgage documents. They were sitting in a room. One thing weighing on the economy. What's remarkable here is that finally the media got it, but they got it probably the story broke in in September of, of 2010. Steve, I think you you did a story which That's I'm going to show in a minute. Story is. Right, That's right. And it took them I think 6 or 7 months to then come out with with this story. I mean, this story if John Grisham had written this story, it wouldn't sell because people wouldn't believe it. You're talking about a multi-trillion dollar fraud. I mean, None of Grisham's stories. I mean, he, he, the, the biggest stories are well, billions of dollar frauds. I mean, these are trillion dollar frauds. They make Madoff look like romper room. And so I'm pleased that, that, that they finally got the story, but it, it took so long for it to come out. Well, I, I have an answer for you, and it is in the very way you frame the question. It is so incredible, you wouldn't have believed it, even if it was a Grisham novel. It was so complicated, only people like you, Roy, who were involved on a daily basis had to go to these, what you call, what did, what, 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 what did you call them, the, the, where, where they had the robo-signings. Right. Um, only those people who were intimately involved, A, knew about it, and B, could believe it. And a journalist is taught to be skeptical. And it takes us time to gather evidence, like a police officer or an FBI agent, and we have to, we can't just, no offense, Roy, because you said it's true, mate, say it is true. We have to have proof. And we worked on proof, and 60 Minutes worked on proof, and they came to what the truth was. That is what we do in journalism. We don't just, because someone calls us up and tells us something, say, oh, that's the truth. We have to have evidence. And I think it took a while to assemble this narrative and get the evidence to prove what, what you knew all along to be true. but. Quite frankly, even when you told me, Roy, I was skeptical. I mean, I, this guy's nuts. He's crazy. This couldn't be happening. But the fact of the matter is, in many cases, it was. Not all cases. And it's the same way with Michael Lewis's book. When I read it, I had to read it the second time. Really? They're bundling mortgages and selling them and making money even when they default? This can't be happening. Not in America. But in fact, it was. And it takes a while to get to that point. So, Pat. <clears throat> Do you think most people understand that there were really two frauds that have occurred? The first fraud was the one that caused the crisis with the bundling, which we've talked about with the marked cards versus counting cards, and now this whole falsification of documents in connection with foreclosure fraud. I think that that they're getting to that. I'm not sure that the average guy on the street still really understands it. It's so complicated, none of us understood it uh, to start with. But I think what you're seeing when you see these strategic defaults is people are saying, okay, if that's how you're going to treat me, this is how I'm going to treat you back. We don't have a bond anymore. I, I promised to pay you back, but you didn't tell me that you were going to do all kinds of tricks to me to do that, what you had talked about earlier. You know, it's like you talk about, Steve, like in a, in a wonderful life where George Bailey, um, you know, all of a sudden the little local banker has a problem and he's been so good to his, to his customers over the years and the family's been good and then when he needs them, that bond is there and they all come back at, at Christmas and put money back in the bank, lend the bank money so they can, they can survive, right? Today, that relationship, I mean, we, we, we laugh at that. We laugh at that. You wouldn't have 10 years ago. It's that recent, I think, even five years ago. Right, right. I mean, you saw some of those people where they were, right. I don't feel good about this. But less and less, I think, right. people are feeling that way. And Pat raises a really good point, and that is this is changing at warp speed. And this is life in the new millennium. And we're all still getting a handle on it. And so I applaud those journalists like Scott Pelley in 60 Minutes and, and CBS4 for having the courage to pursue the story that no one else 
really got on top of, uh, or very few. Uh, Michael Lewis did. There were others who, who did. Rolling Stone Magazine, you, you've mentioned um, uh, Matt Taibbi. Um, they, they, they've been on top of it. But the mainstream media, and, and yes, that is a fault of the mainstream media. Sometimes we go in a pack. And it's hard to break away from the pack. So those journalists who have broken away need to get that praise because it is a difficult subject, and I think we're still learning about it. I would also say, and I think you're going to point it out in our story that aired in September, one of the other tragedies of that is that the government has failed us too. The government pledged to have programs in place to help you if you were underwater on your mortgage. Well, very few people actually got help. It was a good talk. But it actually, they didn't back it up with money and action. And we point that out in our story. And, and, and we're going to show in a second, but I think you bring up a wonderful point. The idea that we're going to rely on this cavalry that's going to come to bail us out is just so misguided. I mean, people need to understand that if they want to bail themselves out, they got to do it themselves. they got to take the bulls by the horn and figure out a way to bail themselves out. And when we reinvented our law firm, one of the things that we were able to do was, was enable people to figure out what the best thing for them to do is, whether they're going to do a modification, whether they're going to do a strategic default, whether they're going to do a foreclosure defense, whether they're going to go bankrupt, whether they're going to do a deed in lieu of foreclosure, are they going to do a structured foreclosure, or any one of those, or a permutation of those things. But the government's not there to help you. But what the government is there to do is give you the laws and the tools to figure out how to fashion your own bailout. And Excellent point, Roy. And I want to I want to I want to add to that. And I, I feel like I must because I don't want to unfairly castigate all the government and all the banks and all Wall Street because in fact there were there were irresponsible loans taken by individual homeowners. They took more money than they could afford. They did not do their own research. I don't ever take a loan that I don't know I can afford. And there were banks offering me money. Oh, interest only. Take it. Take it. Oh, the house will go up in value. Trust us. And the fact of the matter is you as a consumer must take responsibility as well. And I think that's what you're saying. You must be enabled. Go to Roy and other experts, but know what your tools are, but don't rely on someone else, be it the banks, be it the government, be it some salesman. That's exactly right. And, and so, Steve, I want to go now to the piece that you did that, that I think really started the change in attitude by the press. I felt it was like everything was coming down. Xavier Bracco has battled his mortgage lender for nearly a year, ever since a cut in pay at work forced him to miss one payment by 30 days. I came in and I started seeing doors open. Seven different times, workers sent by the bank have broken into Bracco's home, changing the locks in an apparent attempt to take possession and foreclose. It's just um, a system that's run amok. Institutions that think that they are higher than the law. It's a system that now threatens to descend into chaos and involve everyone. I felt as like everything was coming down. Xavier Bracco has battled his mortgage lender for nearly a year, ever since a cut in pay at work forced him to miss one payment by 30 days. I came in and I started seeing doors open. Seven different times, workers sent by the bank have broken in. Steve, I know there were other parts of the uh, story that we didn't cover, but why don't we just summarize what else was in that, in that story? Well, we talked about the robo-signings. Right. We actually attended um, um, a, a court in Broward County where essentially we had a long line of lawyers and all they were doing is rubber stamping and robo-signing. This was a couple of days uh, before the New York Times then came out with its article on Broward County, um, ironically. Um, that did much the same thing, looked at the, the fact that the courts were overwhelmed. I mean, and the judges oftentimes, I won't say every time, but oftentimes would essentially rule in favor of the banks because the judges would look at a bank with all its lawyers and power and money and little old homeowner and say, well, the banks couldn't have made a mistake or couldn't have robo-signed. We also raised issues of whether, in fact, the, some of these documents were legitimate. And within a week or and a half, countrywide, I believe it was, and Bank of America suddenly stopped um, having foreclosures because they realized uh, many, if not all, of the documents on many of their cases were, in fact, forgeries, to use Roy's word. As a reporter, I try not to cast judgment, but there certainly were great questions. And we raised all of those issues in a series of reports we did in September of 2010. Absolutely. And Pat, um, how do you think this crisis is affecting your current development? 
Well, it, it, the, the problem we have here is a total lack of confidence in the system. People, every day you pick up the paper and prices have dropped another 8% or another 10% in the last quarter, much less in the last year. That's really making it tough to convince people that it's time to come, you know, buy a new house when they don't know again whether even at the prices that new houses are selling for today, which are a remarkable bargain, whether that's going to work because down the street they can buy a very similar house for 20, 30 percent less. And it's, it's making it extremely difficult. I don't know how my builders, frankly, are selling houses at all uh, with this, this unease in the market. And the banks have contributed to this by th they, they should be trying to prop up values, not kill them. And when you see this robo signing and these documents being forged and all the rest of it, you say to yourself, what are they thinking? And unfortunately, a lot of them are thinking, we don't really care because the deal that that got cut when this bank was bought said that the government was absorbed 50 percent or 100 percent of their losses. So they don't really care, you know. And I wonder why they fight this stuff as much as they do because you and I are paying for it. So it's it's incredibly difficult. It's costing I don't know how many jobs in the construction industry um, and all the overflow that comes from that. You know, if if that carpenter's not working, he's not buying a new car. You know, his wife's not buying a new dress. Uh, it it just you've seen what it's done to the economy. I think you make a good point, and I want Steve to comment on this, but in Florida we have what I, I like to call the real estate industrial complex, and the types of, of, uh, of jobs you're talking about, whether it's a construction guy or the real estate lawyer or the surveyor or the banker or the builder or the developer or even the banker, that represents maybe 25 percent of the, of, of the gross national product of the state of Florida. What, 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 what are your thoughts on that, Steve? I, I think Pat raises an issue that, you know, I almost want to ask Pat, did, do you see a bottom? I mean, are we, is it going to, in our lifetime, Roy and I have talked about it, will, will, I might be looking to buy a house, but should I? Because in fact, have we seen a bottom or is it going to be another generation before this confidence you talk about? And I think, Pat, you're absolutely right, before the confidence is restored because it, there is a ripple effect throughout the economy. And, and you're absolutely right as far as propping up the banks. The banks have no incentives many times. Again, I don't want to say paint with too broad a brush. Many times they don't have enough incentive to settle or to go ahead and make a, a deal with a house that's underwater because they're going to get money either way. So why take a loss? Why not force these people out? Why not force the deal? Because they're, they're going to get reimbursed by, by the government in many cases, not all every case, as well. So you're absolutely right. I think we have not seen the bottom, and I think uh, it, it's troubling for the next couple of years. What do you think? When, when do you think the bottom's going to be reached? I don't think we're there. You know, I think, I, I hope it's another year or two. Uh, we've been saying that for five years. That's right. Uh, I never expected it to last this long, but I never expected this kind of behavior, frankly. And, as, and I'll say it again, as long as we, we get these stops and these starts, okay, we're working through these foreclosures so we can see the end of the tunnel and now people will be in the market for a new house. But we're not working through them because we're all going to stop now because we're doing robo signs, we're doing other things. So now they're all going to be put back, and now we push this thing another year because people don't know what's going to happen. And while the banks shouldn't necessarily expect the government to bail them out, the government should certainly be doing more, and I don't mean by giving them money, but they should, we bailed the banks out. They should be forced to staff and man up to get the people in place that know what they're doing to quickly work through this stuff because until we work through it, it, it you want to know when the bottom is? Bottom is when we're through with 90% of the foreclosures. That's the bottom. And until we do that, if we're dragging them out year after year after year, it's just going to keep going. It's interesting because we traveled to Washington, D.C. to talk to uh, some of the uh, lobbyists for some of the biggest banks in the country, including Bank of America, um, Wells Fargo. And, and they now are insisting they want to help homeowners. And I got to tell you, I think they do because I think they also see that as long-term economic that this is going to hurt them. Now, it's not hurting them immediately, but I think they, they are worried now about the long-term ramifications of this. And I, I, I think I think it's going to take, I like your 90% number, until we see these foreclosures shake out, I think we, we, we have troubling times ahead. Now, Bank of America says that they have $408 billion of, of bad loans. They want to reduce in three years that amount in half. So that's 204, let's say 200 billion. So presumably it'll take another three years to do that. So if, if they can cut it in half in three years, and presumably if they can go at the same pace and no new loans are added, we're going to give them all the benefit of the doubt, at a bare minimum, Pat, are we not talking six years in all candor? 
It could be. I, I hope it's not. There are still people, uh, Miami's a perfect market to explain that with. There are still markets, the condo market in Miami, right. which has gone against everything that people right. thought. We thought we had, what, 15,000 units and we're going to take seven, eight years to get rid of right. at least. We have inventory for maybe another nine months or a year. Right. Uh, you know, the related companies who were one of the victims of this whole That's mess, right. uh, they now are out buying new property and doing things. So th there are specific markets uh, where outside people you know you've got bottom feeder investors you've got uh you've got users from out of the country in miami particularly south american european those kind of things and you and in my case and i sell lots to builders that build primary housing you know bread and butter stuff and there are still people out there that want a new house and they and they are willing to pay more to have that and not to go through the aggravation of trying to buy a short sale which we all know what that is uh but there's a limit to how hard they'll push until they're confident that the investment they're making today is a safe investment. I don't think anybody's looking to get rich off houses anymore, but what you are looking to do is when you put your money into it, you sure don't want to have to give it back. Right. I, I do want to make a point you just raised, Pat, and that is my colleague David Sutta just did a story in the last 48 hours on just what you said. There used to be you couldn't give a condo away. We were at 17,000 condos in Miami. Now I believe it's under two. Yeah. And I, so that's good news, Roy. That's that great is, news. I mean, the consumers need to take away from that. There is good news. There, there is light at the horizon. And maybe if there's more confidence, that will continue the rebound. But Miami is unique. That, I mean, absolutely. I mean, Miami but, is, but, is a very special. Miami also right. took the die first with right. Phoenix. That's it right. was Miami, that's Phoenix, right. and Las Vegas, right. as you saw, right. that was leading the country in, right. in this horrible problem. So there is good news with the bad. But if it's going to take six years to get rid of this inventory, it doesn't mean prices will drop for six years, but it does mean that we probably, as you're suggesting, Pat, haven't yet really hit bottom. Then we're kind of maybe still in that trough where it may drop for another year or two and then maybe kind of wobble along and then start to creep up. But with that kind of inventory, I mean, the banks can't, I mean, can you imagine Bank of America tried to unload $408 billion of real estate in, in six weeks or six months or in half a year? What would happen to the value of real estate? What would happen to the value of the bank? The bank wouldn't even pass their own stress tests. You know, it's funny, you and I were talking over lunch a couple of months ago, Roy. We, we, we talked about the TARP money, just joking around, wonder if it might have been better to give those trillions or whatever to individual homeowners to pay off their mortgages, and that way we would have made sure the money was pumped back into the economy and into the system and yet propped up that system. Who well, knows? Well, FDR actually, basically, they wrote checks to the homeowner and the bank and the homeowner had to use the money to pay down their mortgage. So this way, the homeowner got the benefit, but the money went to the bank and everyone was a winner. This time, what did the banks do, Steve, with the money? They took the money and then wouldn't give any more loans, right. interest rates, I mean, and, and they're sitting on money that's right. meant many times taxpayer money that was meant to prop them up. That's one of the things we haven't talked about. And the fact is, it's extremely difficult to get a loan. You, you, you can hear that they're available. They're not easily available. Uh, and I don't mean you should be getting a loan if you have to stretch. I'm talking about a guy right. who's got a good, solid job, even in this economy, who's putting down 20%, who's trying to do the right thing, and he can afford that loan. It's a battle for him to get that. And until the banks do that, uh, start being you know aggressive lenders again and, and actually making good loans, that's another big problem that we've got. The, I want to ask you guys a question. I don't understand, and I'm not a financier, but I don't get it. Why don't they restructure? Nobody used to be writing any checks here. If, if you've got a guy whose house is worth $180,000 today, and you're going to foreclose them out, and you're going to get that house back, and it's going to be full of mildew because it's going to sit for six months, and you're going to get that back and get $140,000 for it, um, why wouldn't you just restructure? Why wouldn't you just say to the guy, and, and by doing that, effectively prop up the market because you'll level out the values and and you don't have to wait six months to get the house back you don't have to carry it you don't have to sell it you don't have to go through all that stuff why wouldn't you take at least with I, I know there's a lot of fraud cases guys that flipped and did stuff but there's a I gotta believe that 70 80 percent of the loans that are in default right now are not that are people that really just had a tough time why wouldn't you restructure those loans and you don't see any of that going on maybe you do and if you do I'd, li I'd like to hear about it well CBS just did a great story with Al Sunshine so I'm gonna right. let Steve uh, answer that question first. well I think part of the part of the, the answer is banks are scared they do that too much and word gets out 
then everybody's going to want that, and then that's going to reward bad behavior. I do think there are there is a significant enough part of the population, and I will say it's a minority, but a significant who way overstretched. They they were getting three hundred thousand dollar mortgages when they could afford eighty or a hundred because they were gambling, gambling that the price of that house would be a four hundred when they wanted to sell, and so I think. And there's obstinance. There is the, it's a big company, and if I let you know Stephen Stock re, re, redo his mortgage, then I gotta let Roy do it, and then I gotta let, and, and then then this becomes a cascading. And and, and you do problem. have that contagion, but you also have the fact that the banks, the servicers, make more money when they That's foreclose right. as opposed to doing a modification, and so the deck was stacked again against the homeowner because of government incentives and because of the way these contracts are written so that the servicer comes out way ahead if they do a, if they process a foreclosure as opposed to, and, to and here's a the problem the, the servicer should not be doing that right. you right. know that's a clerk job and and what what they won't do is get creative and you can re Re, you can modify a loan, restructure a loan without just saying, okay, it was a $300,000 loan, now it's $180,000. You can, you can get a kicker on the other end if the house is ever sold and the market comes back. There are ways to do things that I just don't see happening. And maybe it is, maybe you see it because you're in it every day. But I don't see any real effort. I don't see $200,000 a year guys working on trying to make, come up with new programs that are going to, that are going to do that. And, and that's the frustrating thing I see. I just, I see what everybody else sees. I see effectively a clerk who has a book in front of him that says, this is what I'll do and what I won't do. And that's the end of it. And until the banks get over that mentality and agree that they've got a lot to lose by letting this whole market go down the tubes, I, I think we've got big problems. We are seeing more short sales now, and, and that's not a government program. That's just right. Americans figuring out how to, how to get out of this, this, this paper bag. And it doesn't create that many negative incentives because if you do a short sale, you get out from under, but you don't get allowed to stay. If you do the modifications, the, these wholesale modifications, if you get a reduction on your mortgage and your neighbor's paying full price and your other neighbor's paying full price, they're going to go into a strategic default because they realized what you just got and they wanted to. And so that contagion that you're talking about, right. Steve, is, is there. But I want to drive home the point, and that was Al Sunshine's story, was that many banks are kicking them out for closing and then getting the difference, at least part of the difference, paid to them by government programs. And right. so it is financially a, a more of an incentive to kick you out of your house than to settle and to re renegotiate and, and, and make a new, new terms of, of the loan. I want to go back to the human aspect of what this crisis has caused, because sometimes you know we're just talking about billions and trillions of dollars and we start to sound like government bureaucrats with the debt level. And I want to just for a minute bring this back to what in human terms this crisis has caused. Cal, can you run that 60 Minutes piece from Orlando, please? We found a lot of families are making a choice between food and electricity. How many of you have had the lights turned off at your house? How do you study when you don't have the lights on at home? We have um, emergency fla flashlights and I usually have to use them. I just light candles and sit around in a circle of candles. Candles? Yes, ma'am. I use candles because my mommy brings some. I'll go out to the car and turn on the overhead and read out there and study. Ashley Ray raised her hand to add something that we didn't expect. I kind of feel like it's my fault that we don't have enough money. I feel like it's my fault that they have to pay for me and the clothes that they buy for me. They're believing it's their fault that they're in the situation. We found a lot of families are making a choice. I found this one of the most compelling stories that I had seen probably in, in years, and, and I hope you know, this story particularly wins what, as a Peabody, is, it, is that what Peabody or a DuPont uh, are considered uh, the premier, the equivalent of the Pulitzer Prize. I, I, it goes back to what I said at the very beginning of this show, Roy, and that is the narrative. Um, you're absolutely right. For the American public, for our viewers as journalists, it is really difficult to get you fired up and upset and bring tears to your eyes like Scott's piece did. I saw that when it first aired as well. Um, by talking about billions and trillions and being angry with the banks and Wall Street, it, it's really hard. But when you tell the human story, and that's what Scott did, um, it brings it home. I will tell you that for years as a journalist, I, I worked in Orlando for 16 and a half years. I was told by principals and teachers 
um, here and in the Orlando area, that they were seeing more and more students who would leave after three months. And I asked why? Because their parents were moving them from hotel to hotel because they were no longer living in a home. And we were nev never able to put that narrative together, and Scott in 60 Minutes did in a most compelling way. And if you haven't seen it, um, after you're done watching Roy and listening to Roy's advice, I highly recommend you go to cbs.com, click on 60 Minutes, and play that story because it brings the human cost of this massive problem home in a way no one else can. Pat, you, you hadn't seen this before. This no. is the first time you've seen this. Just just tell us your, your visceral gut reaction well, to, to I, this. I think, it's, I think it's terrible, and I think it's an embarrassment to, to the way this whole situation's come down. And, you know, I, you can give examples not nearly as heartbreaking, but the, the condo associations that have failed because in Florida, the banks get a big break. If they take a house back or a condo, they don't have to pay the fees. They pay six months' worth, that's it. Now you have people that are living on a shoestring, barely making it as is, and now their condo fees have tripled. Right. And if they want to keep the electricity right. on, they want to keep the pool clean. So they're not just stiffing the, or not stiffing, but they're not just going after the, the borrower. They're affecting a lot of other people, like kids and like people that have worked and are doing what they're supposed to do in their condo or their homeowners association. In our case, it's CDD fees. You know, when a house goes under in Durban, we have a CDD out there, a community development district, and you're, you have to pay those fees and those taxes. Well, what happens is when that happens, um, they don't pay. So now what happens? Now we've got a situation where the, the overhead and, and all the things that the CDD does, which essentially is run the whole project and mow the lawn and do all those things, all the amenities, everything else, are now can be in jeopardy. We've been very fortunate. We have a, a, st a solid project, but many haven't. And you've seen the failure outright of these things. I find it amazing that you would punish a guy, you would come to a guy and say, okay, you know, we're going we're gonna to let you short sell your house for $160,000, but we're kicking you out. We're going to throw you out in the street. We're going to show you. You did it to us, so now we're going we're gonna to stiff you and throw you out. And we're going to give the guy down the street who doesn't have any sweat equity, no equity in money in this house, and we're going to let him come live in your house for the same price. And there's your, something wrong with that. And it there's, was your home. Yeah, and, and, you know, there's something wrong with that. And, and I, I get the fear that everybody's going to do it, and I'm not sure how you get around that, but there's some pretty smart guys. They proved it in the banks. They made a lot of money until it exploded. But there's got to be a better way. My concern is that there aren't enough smart people trying to figure out how to resolve this problem. I, I don't get the sense of commitment from, no. from Washington. I don't get the sense of commitment from the White House. I know when everyone's running for president, they were, there was a lot of good talk, but then when you put the Goldman people in the White House and you put them in charge of the Treasury and you put them in charge of, of the Federal Reserve effectively, um, how do you expect to get a good result when, when the fox is, is running the hen house? I don't understand it. Steve? Well, I'm, I'm not, certainly not going to get into politics. It's my job to hold the politicians accountable. I think you raise a good issue and questions that are, that it's a fair question. Some of the same people involved in the Wall Street banks are now involved in Treasury and some of those decision-making. Uh, Tim Geithner, um, Larry Sumners, uh, those kind of people. Uh, and, and so I think you raise good questions. And I, I think you, your, your angst is right. Uh, you know, what happened to America where, where the guy who worked hard was rewarded, now it's sort of you kick him out because, you, you know, we're going to bring someone else in. And let some, inv so let some investor come in and who d who's and done nothing. Done he's nothing, done and, he, and now he's going to buy at the bottom and make a hit on your money, the money you put in as, as, the, as your down payment. I almost wonder why, if Wall Street can come up with these bundlings and these creative things, why can't they come up with something that helps the American homeowner? And I think really it, it might be in our capitalist system, fair or not, it may be it, the solution doesn't lie in Washington, but on Wall Street. And until somebody, maybe that's the next billionaire, is somebody who comes up with these kind of tools or instruments that both make Wall Street money and allow Americans to keep their homes. I'm sure they're out there. There's smarter people than me that do these things. I, I want to put the covers of, of Matt Ty Tybee's uh, covers from, from Rolling Stone, because it's interesting. Here you have you know, a magazine that's really like at the edge of, of, of acceptability. We only get it at home because my son likes it. And, and he's reading it for different reasons, and I'm looking at these at, at, at Rolling Stone, and I'm saying, "Wow, look, look, look at this story!" Yeah. Now, now I'm reading it because I'm finding it interesting. But it's kind of interesting that that it, it took someone like like Ro in Rolling Stones uh, to uh, 
point out the, the relationship between the government and Goldman Sachs, the relationship between the government and, and Wall Street, and how these bailouts were primarily focused on, on paying back Wall Street. And, and the, the large bonuses continued to get paid tens of millions of dollars using bailout money. And then the extra bailout money was used to lobby Congress to make sure that there wasn't the institutional change that would be required to make sure that this crisis doesn't, doesn't happen again. Um, I guess one of the questions is, is home ownership really maybe not the answer for most Americans? I remember most Western civilizations today, in Europe particularly, people do not own homes. Generally speaking, they rent. And so, Pat, I, I ask you what, what you think about maybe the, this whole American dream concept being redefined. I, I, th I think we got to a point where everyone thought it was their God-given right, no matter how much money they made, no matter how much they owed, whatever, to have a home. And, and probably I was as, you know, I marketed homes and I still do today. And, we, you know, it's the American dream and we all want to do that. I don't think it was ever realistic. And I think you know, that there are certainly a lot of people that would be a lot better off financially by, by renting. They didn't buy a home because they wanted a home. They bought a home because they thought they were going to make a lot of money. Right. And, and that's, that's what was wrong. And, and, you know, and, and so, yeah, I think we need to rethink that. I think people need to have realistic expectations. Uh, I don't think there's any choice of that anymore. The banks certainly won't. They're, they're difficult with a good credit rated buyer, much less someone who really can't afford a house who's stretching to do it. But that's where the banks were complicit. And in parallel to what Pat's saying, not only was it the American dream and the right to own a home, but it was also that that home would never go down in value right. and it would always right. go up and you were guaranteed a return on the investment. There are no things in life guaranteed other than death and taxes. And, and this is one of the things that I think even if you do buy the home, and I hope, I'm renting right now, but I hope to one day buy, but I will not buy with some pie in the sky dream I'm going to double my money. Right. I'm going to buy because I want to have a roof above my head for my wife and I to live, not because this is where I'm going to put my money. If I want to make money, I'm going to put it on Wall Street. And I think the American public has come to that rude awakening over the last three or four years. But if we look at the interest groups that have promoted this idea of owning a home is American pie, it's part of the American dream. We look at the developers, we look at the realtors, we look at the bankers, uh, we look at the tax incentives for, for mortgage deduction. I mean, over and over and over again, the government was steering you into home ownership. And I remember George Bush was running around in China talking about how, how great it was uh, that we had reached over 70 percent of home ownership in the United States. People who clearly didn't couldn't support a mortgage were, were getting loans through, through liar loans, no doc loans. And so uh, I, I think ultimately if we're going to get ourselves out of this, we have to rethink the paradigm of home ownership. And I think there is still going to be home ownership. But look, look today, the government announced that they're not going to support uh, guarantees on, on, on mortgages over what, $708,000, Pat, was it? I believe so, yeah. And so uh, what's going to happen to that market? Uh, you raise great issues, and I think, I hate to say trite, time will tell, but you're absolutely right. These are issues, and perhaps the paradigm needs to change. Interesting. Do we have questions, Lisa, for that, that people have? or? We're waiting for the microphone. Okay. He's watching. Thank there you. There we go. Now we now we've got it. One of the questions. Thank you, Steve. One of the questions was um, an article that came out a couple weeks ago in Reuters talked about that Miami and Orlando will be pulling Florida out of the recession from a real estate standpoint. What are your thoughts on that? That. Me I, I think it'll pour Orlando and Miami out of the recession. It's not going to do anything for Jacksonville, I can tell you. Um, yeah, good news is always good news. It, it, it will help in the sense that it, it's some good publicity, some good news instead of every day reading how much values have gone down. But those are anomalies in the market. They're not the market. If we're talking even Florida, much less the United States, um, we have the things we've talked about today, the fundamentals have to change. I, and I, I, to add on to that, I, I think especially in South Florida, the dynamic, at least in the Miami area, is so much different than Central Florida and Jacksonville, Orlando. You have a lot of retirees, retirement communities, top of the world in Marion County, the villages in Marion, Sumter, and Lake County. Um, that while they're not booming like they were, they're still growing, and there is still a market for those kind of communities, Newport Ritchie. Um, whereas Miami, I, I have to say, I, despite the good news on the condo front, 
I, I'm with Pat. I don't think we've seen a bottoming out of prices or on sales. I just saw some figures that even now that they expect the, the amount of sales and the prices to continue to slide in Miami. I think Miami was so overpriced and there were so many people who were buying properties they could not afford that I think we're going to see another wave of foreclosures come through some of these higher end markets and Miami is right up there to get hit with a double whammy. So I wouldn't put my eggs in the Miami basket, perhaps other parts of Florida. Steve, uh, I just want to follow up with you. When you talk about this foreclosure wave, what is your thought process that the courts will now not be equipped to handle this next wave because they uh, have lost a lot of staff, their budget has been cut, and because they were relying on income, from the foreclosures previously, but because the foreclosures stopped because of the foreclosure for fraud crisis, those funds aren't there for the retired judges, they're not there for the clerks, they're not there for the assistants, they're not there for the retired judges. Those are the things exactly what Pat was pointing out. Here comes that other wave, and is this going to stall whatever rebound we have? I think those are very legitimate issues. I also believe that the courts are no longer going to trust the banks. They've been, they've been shown the error of their ways and they aren't going to be robo-signing. They're going to be holding accountable because now you and I are going to be looking at the judge who did the robo-signing and so I got to tell you I think that's also going to slow things down to a crawl. So I think that's a very real possibility especially here in South Florida which is why again I think you have to look at the rest of Florida and South Florida as two separate entities I believe. Again I'm you're more of an expert than I am, Roy, but everything I read and study, I, I, I think I, I wouldn't count on Miami to, to lead the way, so to speak, to a rebound. Orlando, perhaps. Jacksonville, yes, but, but not, Orla not Miami. Lisa? Okay, we have a question from Facebook. So um, they would like to know your opinion on the homeowners who were foreclosed on in 2008 and 2009 before the programs were in place when they were told their only option was foreclosure. Now they have bad credit, and what, what type of advice do you have? What's your outlook for them? I guess that goes to me, guys. Yeah. <laughs> um, if, in fact, they were foreclosed in 2008, um, it really depends if the banks are coming after them now for a deficiency or not. They may be one of the, the lucky ones that are going to be able to proceed in life, and the banks will not come after them. Uh, while we're seeing banks coming after some folks for deficiencies, I was speaking to USA Today, actually, and, and I was explaining to them uh, this afternoon that the banks that are doing that are more like the community banks, they're more like the credit unions, loans that had private mortgage insurance, but that the large banks, whether it's Bank of America or Citibank, we're not seeing wholesale uh, deficiency judgment prosecutions against individuals who were foreclosed in, in the past two or three years. And I think part of that is political. I think part of that is, is that they, cannot, they would not be able to sustain the public outcry during this election cycle uh, if, in fact, uh, the banks were to come after people individually. I would predict that after this election cycle, and assuming the economy gets better and that, that uh, employment drops from, you know, unemployment drops from 9% to maybe 7%, that we will see these judgments bundled. I think they maybe get securitized. I think they'll be sold to Wall Street, and I think they'll, they'll be settled at, at 10 to 15, 20 cents on the dollar, ultimately. And I was going to say, in a, from a practical standpoint, if you're Bank of America or Wells Fargo, Citibank, you, you just got so many bad mortgages, you're not going to go chase those who've already in 2008, 2007. Right. Yes, maybe a small little mom and right. pop where you, you know, they have smaller groups, but they just don't have the time or the energy right. and the return on their investment is not so you're lucky yeah i mean that they just don't have right. that that's that's good written off and they're moving right. on and so it's kind of first in first out right right and pat you have a thought on that or no i I, th I tend to agree with you i mean i think that's probably the advantage right. of having gone through the you know right. losing your home is certainly not a good thing but if you had to if, it, if you're at least not getting chased down for for that deficiency uh that's probably the best right. they can hope in, for. in fact the reporter today uh, from usa today was saying that those people who not only went into foreclosure but went bankrupt in 08 and 09 they compared them to people who stayed in their homes financially, and I'm going to let you two guess who's doing better. <laughs> I'm guessing the ones who declared bankruptcy back in 2008. Riding high. Very happy. Thrilled that they did. They look back at it like it was another lifetime ago. And so, again, we start to question, you know, 
not the moral issue, but what is the right thing? What is your fiduciary duty to your family in terms of paying a, a, a loan that's underwater caused by an economic crisis to a large extent caused on Wall Street? Uh, Lisa, you had another question? There was just another part okay, to that sure. question. Sure. Um, they were asking about the credit side of that. So, Roy, you've talked about in your past blogs about how people's credit, it's, right. it's not going to matter as much anymore. So can you address that part? Because well, well certainly a anyone who was foreclosed two, two years ago took a hit on their credit. Uh, and Fair Isaac, actually, the people uh, do the FICO score, Fair Isaac Company, that's what FICO stands for, uh, have been releasing more and more information now uh, to tell you how that process works. Actually, they're doing it, I think, at, at the behest of the banks to try and scare you so that you know that you're going to take a hit on your credit. But the reality is, and I've spoken about this before, is that we should be less concerned about our credit score. We should be more concerned about when you buy something that you have the cash to pay for it now. And if we started to teach our children that, and I think they're going to grow up with that, if they go to Congress one day, they wouldn't keep raising the debt ceiling. They wouldn't keep spending on stuff that we can't afford. And so we would start to live within our means. And so I think credit scores, and, and I think the people who, who defaulted two years ago, probably their credit scores are coming back right now. Because if they started to pay on other obligations, whether it's a car or even just a credit card, their credit scores are coming back. Um, so you're going to take a hit. I mean, if you're going to do any of this, you're going to take a hit. But the only clients I have, I always tell people this, and when we used to have a, a room full of, of, of folks before we went, went, went on the Internet, uh, I'd ask, how many of you used to have a good credit score? There wasn't a single person that would not raise their hand. The only people who got into trouble in this economy were people with good credit. If you had bad credit, you didn't get in trouble because you already were, were understood that you weren't going to buy something if you couldn't afford it. And by the way, just because you have bad credit doesn't mean you're a deadbeat. doesn't mean you don't have money. It just means that, you're not good, that you don't have good credit. But I know a lot of people running around who, who are you know, rather you know, comfortable, even wealthy, and they have lousy credit. And you know what? They're not getting themselves in trouble. But to answer the question, Lisa, he's right. You will get a bad credit score. But Roy is saying that may not be such a bad thing fiduciary for your family, right. f financially for your family. But your credit score will go down right. if you do. We have one more question off Twitter, and that's um, somebody was asking to address deficiency judgments. And where do, you, where do you see that? You know, the deficiency judgment is the 1,000-pound gorilla uh, in Florida. Uh, in fact, the USA Today is doing a second story that they, they, they talked about today. And they, uh, they, they found my uh, op-ed piece that I had done for the um, Sun Sentinel called the divided states of America. And I had talked about the fact that only in the United States could you have two families, one on the West Coast in California, one in Florida, both have, let's say, a $250,000 loan, both walk away. Guy in California takes a, takes a hit on his credit score, goes off, no, he never hears from his bank again, they don't come after him, they don't garnish his wages, they don't take his car, they don't come after his, his, his cash in his bank account, they don't go after his stock account. In Florida, he walks away, and for 20 years, okay, including his estate if he dies, they can come after his car. They can garnish his wages. They can take cash that's not in an IRA or in a 401k, and they can make your life a living hell. I mean, no other Western civilization can you have two sets of facts and in two situations come out with completely two distinguished uh, types of scenarios. Now, the reality is, as I said earlier, the larger banks are not necessarily pursuing the deficiencies as aggressively or deficiency judgments as aggressively as we're seeing the smaller banks, the community banks, and if you have private mortgage insurance. Now, if you do a short sale, we're seeing some of the banks, if in fact you can demonstrate that you don't have a lot of cash sitting around, they're going to let you walk from your obligation and thus you're not going to have a deficiency. In other cases, people have to come with a little cash, sometimes 10, 12, 20 percent of the difference, of the amount of money that, that you're still missing. Uh, and in other cases, if you don't have the money and you have a decent salary, they may ask you to pay something every month, 200, 300 bucks a month. And then if you default on that, you come back to us and we start all over again. Uh, anyone have a comment? Go I ahead. wanted to ask you, so do you recommend that? I mean, if, 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 you, if you are in trouble, is that, is that a financially viable solution for your family to do the short sale, even if you have to pay a little bit of your wage? to make that 10, 20 percent of the difference for a bank to, to satisfy them on yeah. the deficiency. You know, tonight I'm supposed to be asking the No, questions. no, no, I'm asking you. <laughs> <laughs> and normally people get, I usually charge people that's to answer that, that's <laughs> for that answer. But, but, but having said that, um, we evaluate each family situation 
and, and determine what is best for the family. That may be the best answer. Bankruptcy may be the best answer. In some cases, we're going to tell people that they should keep paying because that's really the best thing. But we, we have to look at, 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 at all. The, the, the family dynamics, the holistic environment. You know, did both spouses sign the mortgage? Did only one spouse sign? If only one spouse signed, we do what's called the bus. You throw the, the, the spouse that signed under the bus, and the other, <laughs> the, other, the other other spouse, usually the wife, we hope, is going to ride high. Sometimes it's the other way. but And so then you can ride on the credit of, of the spouse that's on top of the bus. And so there are so many permutations, so many different ways that we evaluate. The bottom line is you need to fashion your own bailout. The cavalry is not coming. If you thought it was coming before the November election, wake up, it's not coming. And, and between now and the election, it's just not, not going to happen. I'm getting a, a note here from uh, Jackie Silver, my assistant, that I'm supposed to uh, uh, wrap up here. So I want to, uh, one more question, well, one it's, more it's, question. It's a okay. reminder question. We want to hear everybody's predictions on where, where you see this going. Well, that's how we're going to wrap okay. up. I'm going to start with Pat. Well, I think we've talked about this foreclosure problem exaggerating the problem. Where, where, we, where we're changing, where the, the builders and the developers are changing to try and compete with that to get our numbers down. Um, I've cut my lot prices 20%. Um, we've gone from our most popular lot as an 80-foot wide lot to a 43-foot wide wide lot. I never thought I'd see that. Uh, <clears throat> the builders literally are building at their own cost. Uh, to you know, to keep their companies viable, and I'm talking major builders, you know, the biggest ones in this country, Wall Street builders. So we're working hard to try, and we're delivering a great value right now. Um, unfortunately, people still have a hard time believing it because they keep seeing all this bad news. I think as long as as we keep trying to do our job and deliver a really good value, that we're going to continue. We used to sell 600 lots a year. Now we sell 150. I'm a number one project in Jacksonville. But that's 150 people in a new house, and, and I'm proud of that. And, and I think, I think it, it's like you said. It reminds me of when Andrew hit Miami. You know, they said, where's the Calvary? And the Calvary really came for a couple of days, and then I was on Rebuild Miami Committee. And what we learned in the first week was we got to help people to rebuild. There's nobody going to come do it for you. Same thing in New Orleans, you know. And so this is – this is a tsunami, and, and we've got to help people on an individual basis figure out, as you said, what's best for my family. might be totally different for me than it is for you, and so everybody needs to, to think about it, and in some cases, maybe buy a new house. Buy a new house. There you go. And, and by well, the way, shameless, that's one, shameless plug. And that is one of our strategies sometimes, is that you end up uh, walking away from your existing house and then reestablish a new homestead. Uh, with a new home, and then they can't take that new home. And so you're, you're using the, the legal system to your advantage based on the existing rules. Steve, what's your, what, what do you think? Well, this is going to surprise you, being that I'm a journalist and always the skeptic. I'm also positive and an and, and optimist. I think if, if I ask those who are watching either now or later to, to think back 18 months, two years, three years, did, did you believe we would be able to turn the economy around like this? Did you believe we would have actually a growth in unemployment? In other words, a net gain of jobs, which the last two quarters have actually reported. The fact of the matter is this country avoided another Great Depression. And the fact is it is coming back. It may be coming back very slowly just because of the issues Roy and Pat sat and talked about, because there are complicating issues. But the fact is there's people like Pat working hard to have affordable housing and have homes available for, bu for buying. There are people like Roy who have strategies for you, the homeowner, to get out of the enormous debt that you're in. And hopefully we've all learned the lesson that we shouldn't be getting mortgages that we can't afford, that these bundlings, hopefully Wall Street or Washington, will finally outlaw this, although I, I, I am a pessimist about that because I think Wall Street and their money and their lobbyists – dominate a lot of what happens in Congress, but I still am hopeful that Congress will continue to work on refining the rules as they're perpetrated up in Wall Street, and that we will emerge from this stronger, and that we that the rebound has already started. And all you have to do is look at the numbers. And as much criticism as has been thrown around, either for the TARP, and remember that was George Bush's program initially, or the, or the stimulus, the fact is the economist both conservative and liberal will tell you that stopped the slide and that helped this country bottom out and start growth again. Without it, we would be in another Great Depression and who knows where we'd be. You're probably right, Steve. I want to thank my guest tonight, Pat Sessions. Thank you so very, very much. Good to see you. Steve Stock, so, so very much. Thank you. Uh, 
Roy Oppenheim from the trenches. This was our, our first program. If you liked it, just let us know so we'll do it again. We just we need to know that, that, that you all out there enjoyed the format and that this was something useful to you all. So again, thank you all very much for watching. Good night and we'll see you soon. Take care.